19 and green whatever this that or whatever the whole push the whole undercurrent is we need to save the planet So let's have Sunday as a rest day in honor of Mother Earth, as, the, as their language says. We need to honor Mother Earth and uh, <laughs> Brother Sky and Sister Water, whatever. men's hearts, failing them for fear of those things that are coming upon the earth. <clears throat> well, when my son, when I was living in Colorado, my son was in his early 20s, and he thought uh, he was going to live a life of exciting outdoor adventure. And so he went down to southern Colorado, and he learned to be a whitewater river guide. if you have any idea what that might mean. And he was on the Arkansas River. Probably never heard of it, but it's uh, southern Colorado. Comes right out of the snow fields of the Continental Divide. And in the spring, down in the country where you're going, close, down there. In the spring, the water is bitterly cold and it is moving very rapidly in the Arkansas River, so it's a favorite place to go whitewater rafting. If you want to get your thrill, you go whitewater rafting. So my son's, you know, he, he takes a year and he's learning how to do this. They're training him how to read the river, okay? And he calls up and he says, Mom and Dad, I want to show you what I can do. I want to invite you to come down and go on a river raft, to run the rapids with me. And, uh, and we're thinking, uh, do we trust him enough to trust him with our life? Huh? Hey, parents. You're going to trust your kids with your life? We're not so sure about this. Okay. So, it, when, when the Arkansas is running at its best, it's about a four, you can get four, five, or five class rapids, which mean they are world class. And a, five, a class five rapid means that the water, you know, is coming up in a heap, you know, probably about five feet, six feet high. Yeah, sure. So when you're going down the river, you have to watch for three things. Rocks rapids, and whirlpools. Rocks, rapids, and whirlpools. Rocks, you get stuck on a rock and the current's so strong, you can't get off. You're stuck there. Or you might get swamped, dumped in the river. Whirlpools, you know where that is, you know, you're just going around in circles. You get suck down and swamp your boat and you're dumped in the river. You can't get out. You know, a strong whirlpool, you can't get out if the current is really strong. So this, this you know, he's explaining all this stuff in, to us and we're thinking, oh, this sounds like great fun. <laughs> so, Two things are needed to make the trip. You need a wetsuit because the water is bitterly cold and you're going to get wet 
and if, especially if you get dunked, you can get hypothermic, which means that if they don't get you out of the water in a hurry, you just bought the farm. <laughs> you have to have a life jacket, right? Life jacket and a wet suit. So at least if you fall in the river, it might keep you long enough that they can haul you out before you're a gunner. So I will include life jacket and wetsuit together. Two items you need. That, I'll classify that as one, okay? They go together. The second item you need is an experienced river guide. Duh. You need somebody to know how to avoid the big rocks and the whirlpools and can take you through the rapids safely. Okay? So we hit this four or five class rapid and the boat goes <coughs> down its end. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. So my son's telling at me, jump on the front of the boat <laughs> and hold the front down so that we don't flip over backwards. So obviously, we survived. And we're cold. And we're wet. And, uh, and we're saying, oh, this was fun. <laughs> Not. I'll never do this again. But I want to draw some spiritual parallels here. All right? If you're going to go through the promised land, you're going to need two things. You're going to need two things. Okay? And uh, you're going to need an experienced guide. Hello, an experienced guide. Is Jesus, does Jesus qualify as an experienced guide, do you think? Uh, if we could move to Hebrews. If I could have Hebrews 2. Thank you. We all feel very welcome. There we go. All right. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Moving on. And release those, and release those who, what? Fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. All right? For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. To the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be, my, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Or in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. We can go to Jesus knowing full well that he is sympathetic to our situation because he's been there and done that. I'll cover that in a minute. But think, think, we all go through the rapids of life, do we not? Uh, maybe you got smooth sailing. Maybe you're just, you know, out there on a flat, smooth pond and everything is cool and lovely. Not a worry in the world. What about the rocks in our life? 
I want to stop us dead in our tracks. The rocks. What are those rocks that we can identify in our life? You know, maybe it's some overwhelming sin. Maybe it's somebody that you can't forgive because they've hurt you and offended you. What is it, this thing that looms so big, that's got your spiritual journey stopped dead? You got some of those? What do you do with it? Trust your river guide. Amen. Take it to Jesus and leave it at the foot of the cross. And what about the whirlpools, you know? The whirlpools always remind me of all those personal dysfunctions that we all have, that we all seem to be caught in some kind of an endless loop, you know, of doing self-defeating, self-destroying, rob us of our mental peace. We're all hung up. We're all hung up on these personal dysfunctions, whether it's family issues or personal issues, baggage, I call it, baggage. We're just going around in circles, and we're not moving forward in our Christian experience. What's your baggage this morning? We've got a, got a little picture there, back there, with Jesus with a whole bunch of suitcases under his arms. He says, I got your baggage, now follow me. Rocks, rapids, and whirlpools. We need an experienced guide. And you say, well, uh, Jesus didn't experience the same thing I did, you know. He, did, he didn't have this dysfunctional family I grew up on. Or, you know, he didn't have to worry about paying his rent. And... No, there's a deeper issue here, right? Let's move to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Do you remember the story? The devil took Jesus and met him out in the wilderness where he was tempted, right? Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You ever been tempted by the devil? Matthew 4, 1. Let's move on with that text. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we, we often think the issue is about hunger and bread, right? But no, Jesus understood that the real issue here was what? Taking God at his word. Amen? Taking God at his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And... Most every word. Is that right? God knows. God knows my circumstances. All right, he knows that I, you know, I really can't be obedient here. I can't be 100% obedient. I can fudge it a little bit. Been tempted to fudge it a little bit? Fudge the health message a little bit. Fudge my stewardship a little bit. Fudge my Sabbath observance a little bit. What? What? Devil took him up into the holy city, sent him on the pinnacle of the temple. Said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hand they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
Well, and we say, well, the devil never took me up into a high place. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt, 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 tempt the Lord your God. And the devil took him up in an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So what's going on here? We've got three temptations, right? We've got three temptations. And if we boil it down, it says if. If you're not following the Word of God, you'll fool yourself into thinking you are a Christian, but end up worshiping the devil. That's really what's going on here. If you're not following the Word of God and claiming to be a Christian, and thinking that God owes you his protection or his salvation, you're only fooling yourself. And in the end, we will end up serving Satan. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, King in the seven, like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. He, again, he sent other servants, telling those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattle cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his own business. And there is. Are we familiar with the story? Do we need to read all of it? Let, let's, let's move down to, uh, okay, King has prepared a wedding, and you and I are invited. Is that right? Do we understand that part? Can we move down to verses 11 and 12? But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there did not have on a wedding garment. We've all been invited. Do we all understand that? But there was a man there who didn't have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He was speechless. So what is the wedding garment? Revelation 7, back to Revelation 7, 9, and 10 again. All these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands, clothed with white robes, crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's a beautiful quote, and I neglected my Acts of the Apostles are all packed away, and I neglected to get one out of the library this morning, but Acts of the Apostles, page 388, second paragraph, makes it very clear that the robe, that the robe, the wedding garment is the robe of Christ's righteousness not my righteousness because I don't have any the robe of Christ's righteousness and the reason that the guest was speechless was because Christ supplies the robe 
And if you don't have it, it's not because it wasn't offered to you. It's because you didn't take the effort, didn't have the desire to accept it. So let's, in closing, let's move on to a couple times. Romans 3.23. And I think we're all familiar with this, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Anybody here that doesn't qualify for that? Being justified, how? Freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the, 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 the key ingredient here is what? Faith in Jesus. Amen? Faith in Jesus. I have to have, I have to trust my life to my qualified river guide. Hello? I have to have faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. And then we move down to Romans 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And I've heard people say, Oh, I believe in God. No. You don't understand what that word believe means. Because if you go to Genesis 26, 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So when it says that Abraham believed God, it meant that he was obedient to the word and the will of God. So if you claim to, oh yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, you know, the devils believe all that stuff too. But if it does not make me obedient, to the word of God. What did Jesus say? There in the wilderness, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word proceeds from the mouth of God. Because Abraham obeyed. Romans 5.19 For as one, by one man's disobedience Many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteousness. So what is the key word here? Obedience. Obedience. Wow. Okay. Another quote from Maranatha. Let's see, August 5, ran across that one here recently. August 5. Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. By his perfect obedience has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. What did I just say? He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, there's the key right there. 
Hello? When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, the will is merged in his will, the mind becomes one with his mind, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him, we live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garments of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Through the plan of redemption, God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait and resisting every temptation, however strong. The strongest temptation is no excuse for sin, however great the pressure brought to pair upon the soul, transgression is our own act. It is not in the power of earth or hell to compel anyone to sin. The will must consent, the heart must yield, our passion cannot overbear reason, nor iniquity triumph over righteousness. If you will stand under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, faithful doing his service, you need never yield to temptation, for one stands by your side who is able to keep you from falling. As we partake of the divine nature, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong are cut away from the character, and we are made a living power for good. Ever learning of the divine teacher, daily partaking of his nature, we cooperate with God in overcoming Satan's temptations. God works and man works, that man be one, may be one with Christ as Christ is one with God. Then we sit together with Christ in heavenly places. The mind rests with peace and assurance in Jesus. So, I want to close with one last story. Mark 4.35. It says, on the same day, when evening come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? I used to wonder about that story. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Hello. What did Jesus say? Do we need to, to tell the story again? Hello. What did Jesus say? We got, we got several different responses here. Hmm? Speak up. Why are you so fearful? Why oh, you have little faith? Yeah, no, no. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Okay? We're going to the other side, boys and girls. Men and women, we're going to the other side. Regardless of the storm and our fear and the rapids and the COVIDs 
And whatever the devil has to throw at us, Jesus said, what? We're going to the other side. Do you believe that? We're going to the other side. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. We're going to the other side. Hebrews. Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Amen? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching, what should we be doing? Huh? Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not fear, little flock. For there is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? When are we going to start living like we believe that? Hello? Good question, isn't it? Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. Obedience. Two things we need. Experienced river guide and the robe of Christ's righteousness. If we have that, we have been sealed for the time of trouble that is soon upon us. Are you ready? Are you ready this morning? If not, why not? If not today, when? Maybe if you examine the whirlpools and the rocks in your own life, <clears throat> the temptation in the wilderness to play fast and loose with God's Word, to tempt God into asking him for his blessings and you pray to him and pray to him for him to fix this and do that or whatever but there is no obedience on your part friends we're running out of time the hour is light it's time way past time to make that full, unreserved commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So as we sing our closing song, if, if the Holy Spirit has moved on to your heart to come and ask God's forgiveness or paying fast and loose with his word for not trusting him for forgiveness or overcoming power or whatever it might be. As we sing the closing song, I would just in invite you to just come up here and kneel and surrender your heart 100% to the Lordship of Jesus Christ.
we do His good will. He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but His smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. <coughs> Not a burden we bear, Not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, <coughs> blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at His feet or we'll walk by the side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. <coughs> Dear loving Heavenly Father, I pray that you will fill each one of us with your Spirit here this Sabbath morning. May you bring peace and forgiveness. May you fill us with your love. May you empower us for obedience, Father. I pray that you would bless each person here today. And keep us faithful to you come is my prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. <coughs> Martin, don't go anywhere. As this is your last <coughs> Sabbath with us, um, the church, uh, we've had several, we've had several retirements and going away parties <laughs> You're for right. you. <laughs> Can't get rid of me very easily. <laughs> it, it seems to be rather difficult. But, um, what we want to say is, you have been an absolutely awesome uh, pastor for us, a spiritual leader. You make us work for it. You, you don't just give us the answer. You make us work for it. You make us dig in. You make us question. Uh, as, as you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to just hand us out the information that, that we walk away uh, and never think about it again. So um, with that, we want to say absolutely thank you very much. 
uh, God has blessed us because of you. And uh, we thank you for all that you have done. And it's sad that we have this COVID uh, separation. Um, but again, uh, the church wants to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you, each one. We shall gather at the river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Yes, we'll gather at the river that thrones by the throne of God. Amen.